Does that go away, Carol? Or do I just say continue? Okay. There we go. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining the Marin History Museum for another Marin History movie presentation. The first thing I want to talk about is you probably all heard the Marin History Museum is going to be moving back to the Boyd Gatehouse this summer with beginning to do this fall. We're all very excited about this. The goal is to relocate the library and research um, in materials to a more central access location, which would be the Boyd Gatehouse. So there will be a room there dedicated to research. But this effort really requires volunteer support and donations. And if you have some spare time, you want to share helping to organize and pack up the library so we can get it ready to be moved to the Boyd Gatehouse, would really appreciate your help. You can contact us at info at marinhistory.org. Put down your um, interest in helping us. If you'd like to make a donation to help with our efforts, um, and the expenses, you could go to our website at www.marinhistory.org and make a donation. So maybe you're wondering what we need donations for. So in the Boy Gatehouse, in our new um, ideas, what we plan to do, we're going to have one room that is dedicated to be a sustained and continuous forever exhibit on Louise Boyd, the Arctic explorer who was born and raised in, in San Rafael at the Boyd Estate, which is next door to the Boyd Gatehouse in Boyd Park, it was all part of the Boyd family. And if you don't know the history of Louise Boyd or the Boyd family, luckily we're moving back to the Boyd Gatehouse and you can come talk to me and I'll tell you more than you wanted to know because we all know I can talk. The other thing that we need um, financial support was for is that we're hoping to get some new technical supplies like a computer so we can set up ancestry.com. We're hoping to get a new TV screen so we can show more of these movies on a continuous type loop or the whole library of DVDs that we have. You might wanna um, watch uh, one of our films. Um, also the, with the real goal is for education for students to come in and maybe see the DVD that's about the Miller family that came across and uh, settled in uh, Marinwood in San Rafael. Um, we operate mainly on donations and volunteers to operate the museum. Now, while we've achieved some small grants, we do depend on donations and membership to keep us going. And so, as you all know, during COVID, we lost our programs, um, um, donations that we were collecting and because we were unable to do the live presentations over at the Elks Lodge. Hopefully that will begin, but I don't think it'll be this year. So what do volunteers do or why do we need them at the Boyd Gatehouse? We need docents to uh, keep the doors open, direct people. We need volunteers to work in the library as assistants for people doing research. So that's my uh, kind of up-to-date information on that. I don't think there's anything else to say other than for tonight's presentation on the builders of the Golden Gate Bridge. At the end of the film, there'll be time for questions. And if you have a story to share about maybe 83 years ago, you walked over the Golden Gate Bridge, or maybe at the 50th anniversary birthday, you walked over the bridge and you have stories, or maybe you heard a story, or maybe you're like me and you make up a story. There'll be time for that. So go to the chat icon and put a comment there that you want to um, ask a question or to share something and I will take care of that. So, um, and then you'll unmute your, um, unmute yourself so that you can share your story. So a little information about the film that we're doing. That I, I just think this is the coolest thing. So back in the 1970s to 76, some 1937 film was discovered and it was put together in the best format of the day, which would have been the 70s. Um, and it's, it turned out to be like old newsreel news film. And it was, um, I'm very grateful that the museum sponsored the efforts of Tara Linda and San Rafael High School's audiovisual departments to preserve the film. Now, my favorite part of this film, and I tell this story all the time, was there's, there's a part where the guy is up on the span on the north side and he's cranking the communication box, talking to the south span, 
getting ready to run the cables to the South shore. And he's cranking this box, repeating over and over again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? So we've had that communication problem since forever. Several um, years ago, the uh, Marin History Museum did some oral histories up at Villa Marin. And we talked with some people who had walked over the bridge in 83 years ago now, it wasn't then, but in 1937. And they tell stories of what it was like to walk over. And I asked them, I go, what'd you do when you got to the North End? Which he said, because it, it shows this crowds. I mean, it's just people back to back, front to back, front to back. And a lot of people came on their bikes and they got to the North End and they said, geez, they don't, couldn't remember. Well, I guess we turned around and walked back, but they had all these bicycles and didn't know what to do. The bikes got thrown over the sides. So underneath the bridge in the bay is full of bicycles. I mean, a lot of bikes. The other thing I thought was curious is they were all warned, do not take any pictures facing the North. It's a military installation, photography was illegal. So the pictures that you see of the next day when the cars were going over the bridge are all facing San Francisco. Cars were able to go off the road and go on down as Sausalito on the dirt road. But that's what it was like 83 years ago. So I think we're ready to start the movie. If I can figure out how to do this share, we're going to, I'm gonna share the screen. I've got everything clicked. Share. Go to the movie. Restart. It's silent here at the beginning, so don't worry about your sound. the story gateway to San Francisco's friendly harbor now stands the longest single bridge span that the genius of the engineer and the skill and resources of the bridge builder have ever achieved. Impressive in its simplicity, modern in its concept, the Golden Gate Bridge is the fulfillment of a long felt need for a direct connection between San Francisco and the territory across the gate. Built in a setting famous the world over for its rugged grandeur, this imposing structure literally opens the gate that for decades has restricted San Francisco from an all-weather outlet to the adjacent North Country. This large-scale photo map, taken from high above and looking eastward from the Pacific Ocean, shows the location of the bridge with respect to the surrounding territory. The city of San Francisco completely fills the peninsula, extending between the Pacific Ocean and San Francisco Bay. Beyond the inner harbor lie the cities of Berkeley, Oakland, and Alameda. At the left, and almost due north of San Francisco, is Marin County. Separating the two is the tidal barrier, the Golden Gate which at its narrowest point is approximately a mile from shore to shore. The Golden Gate Bridge spanning this barrier 
not only provides direct access to Marin County with its seemingly unlimited possibilities for residential and recreational development, but also serves as a connecting link in the highways leading to the Great Northwest. The San Francisco Tower stands 1,125 feet from shore, and the main span of this bridge from the San Francisco Tower to the Marin Tower is 4,200 feet long. Such a structure could be of but one form, a suspension bridge. The flat band paralleling the water is the roadway. Supporting the roadway are the suspenders, which transmit their loads to the two great cables for transfer through the towers to the piers and rock foundations. The roadway, with its six 10-foot traffic lanes and two 10-foot sidewalks, is 256 feet above the water. 90-foot floor beams carry the traffic loads to the stiffening trusses, which distribute them to the suspenders. The towers, extending 746 feet above the water, surpass most of the world's large structures in height. Heavy diagonal bracing below the roadway and horizontal struts above join the two legs into a unit of great strength. Each tower leg is comprised of hollow square cells, the number varying from 21 at the top to 97 at the base. The drawing in the center indicates the manner in which the cells were grouped and fabricated to comply with the limitations of shop and transportation facilities. Here in the assembly shop of Bethlehem's Pottstown Works is a group of tower sections ready to be shipped. Before shipment, the sections were faced square on a giant milling machine. Cutting members were then temporarily this is assembled and holes drilled for the field connection. From the Marin the history, were completely shop assembled and checked for alignment of members and rivet holes. In the entire 700 feet of length, the erectors found that the holes in the members matched perfectly. A fine example of accurate structural fabrication. The stiffening trusses were also assembled in the shop, matched to ensure a perfect fit in the field and the holes for the field connection drilled. As the trusses were too deep to transport as complete units, they were disassembled before shipment. The structural steel, 68,000 tons in all, was fabricated at Bethlehem's works at Pottstown and Steelton, Pennsylvania. Because of the size of the tower section, which weighed up to 80 tons apiece and averaged 40 feet in length, it was found desirable to ship the steel by rail to Philadelphia and thence by water to California. At Philadelphia, it was transferred to vessels of Bethlehem's Kalmar Line at the Port Richmond Terminal for its long journey by way of the Panama Canal. Members that were too large and heavy to go into the hold with the rest of the steel were lashed on deck. By the time the first shipload of steel passed through the Golden Gate, the Bethlehem organization was assembling erection equipment at the bridge site. The ample facilities of the Bethlehem shipyard at Alameda, on one arm of San Francisco Bay, were utilized in storing the fabricated steel until it was needed in the bridge. Two 85-ton derricks were set up on the wharf to transfer the steel from the boats to cars for removal to the storage site. Later, these same derricks were used to load the steel on barges to be carried back five miles to the gate in lots required for the sequence of erection. As ship after ship added its quota to the constantly increasing tonnage in the storage yard, construction of the North Pier was proceeding on the rocky Marin shore. To ensure that the steelwork would start up true and plumb, the pier surface was ground to a perfect plane by specially designed equipment. Carborundum wheels, traveling on accurately leveled steel rails, ground the area of 55 by 34 feet required for each tower leg to a level plane, perfect to within less than one one thousandth of a foot. Tons of water were required to keep the wheels from overheating. The trueness of the surface was carefully checked with instruments during this operation. What is now the fabricated steel construction division of Bethlehem Steel Company was formerly the McClintic Marshall Corporation, 
a subsidiary of Bethlehem. And during the early stages of erection, the work was carried on under that name. The barges loaded at the Alameda storage yard first brought the five-inch steel base plate to be laid on the concrete. Next, the lowermost sections of the tower legs were received. Assembly numbers painted on these sections at the shop were used yeah, always blows my mind about sequence. how I did some. The sea, sweeping in from the open Pacific, was tricky, and more than once it was necessary to hold the barges at Alameda for a day or more until the waves subsided. This condition necessitated that provision be made for storage at the bridge site. A platform was built below the pier and equipped with a derrick for unloading the barges. Sufficient material was kept on the platform to ensure that there would be no interruption in the progress of the work. Actual erection was handled by two other derricks, which will be shown later, and which, of course, could lift material from the platform regardless of wind and waves. Anchorage angles extending 53 feet into the heart of the pier firmly tie the lowermost column sections to the base. Pre-stressed with powerful jacks before being riveted to the tower legs, these angles exert a constant pull on the tower and lock the steelwork to the concrete pier against shocks and twisting strains that may come from any direction. A group of six and one half inch diameter steel dowels were rigidly fastened to the base plate to prevent the tower from shifting on the pier under earthquake forces. The actual erection started with the assembly of the tower base as straight and true and stable as human ingenuity could make it. These hollow square members of varying lengths were assembled to make up the bottom sections of the tower leg. Riveted together, they form a unit of sufficient strength to support a vertical load in excess of 40,000 tons. The derricks, progressing on their long climb, were soon above the transverse strut which marked the roadway level. As much as 800 tons of steel were erected in the course of a day. From the top of the tower, the massive Marin anchorage no longer dominated the background, and the rugged scenery of the North Hills became more apparent. The traveler used for the tower construction was specially designed for its job. Essentially, it consisted of two steel stiff leg derricks mounted on two trusses which spanned between the tower legs. The rated capacity of each derrick was 85 tons, approximately the weight of the heaviest tower section. To place the outer column sections without fouling the higher central sections first erected, 90-foot booms were required. In the engine house on the pier, large electric motors provided the power necessary for handling the heavy load. The framing under the derricks had four movable supports, two on each tower leg, so designed as to furnish ample stability. Each support consisted of a heavy nickel steel plunger which engaged reinforced slots in the tower. Just before the traveler was raised to a higher elevation, these support forgings were withdrawn. After all four supports were released, the traveler was raised by falls hanging from the cat head which rested on the previously erected tower section. It required approximately 10 minutes for the traveler to be raised a distance of 40 feet to its new position at the construction level near the top of the steelwork. As the traveler rises, one of the slots appears, reinforced with heavy plates for the support forging. After each jump of the traveler, the support forgings were again shot home. Following the raising gangs came the riveters, working on steel frame scaffolding arranged with double decks to permit driving at two levels. A heavy roof protected the workmen against injury from objects that might be dropped by the raising gangs several tiers above. The equipment required for riveting, with a supply of rivets and fitting up bolts, was kept on the platform. While bridgemen were driving rivets on the outside of the tower, other gangs inside the tower were working by the light of miners' electric lamps. The task of keeping each gang supplied with its quota of the 600,000 field rivets required in each tower was no small one. All rivets were heated outside the tower and passed to the gangs inside the cells through pneumatic tubes, inserted through small reinforced holes provided in the cell walls for that purpose. After placing the red-hot rivet in the pressure pot, 
the heater released a valve, and the rivet sped to its destination, often a hundred feet or more away. The heavy diagonal bracing below the roadway, designed to carry a stress of over 2,100 tons, was a riveter's paradise. As erectors and riveters moved upward steadily, elevators were used to expedite the handling of miscellaneous equipment and to carry the men to and from their work. The steel cage, supported from an extension on the traveler, shuttled ceaselessly from the pier below to the topmost point at which the raising gangs were working. By following the construction elevator on a trip from the pier to the traveler, the various phases of erection activity may be observed. After the completion of erection, a permanent elevator, three feet square, was installed in the innermost cell of the east leg of each tower for the use of inspectors and maintenance men. Each cell has a steel ladder to permit passage between sections not served by the elevators. During erection, signal men were stationed on the traveler mast. By means of signal cables, paid out as the traveler moved upward, these men passed down instructions to the hoisting engineers on the pier below. At this point, the traveler had reached the 600-foot level above the pier, about as high as a 50-story building. Here, each tower leg comprised 21 cells, arranged in a rectangle three cells wide by seven long. This arrangement of cells was maintained for the remaining hundred feet. The shadow of the tower bulks large on the face of the cliff. Across the bay, the city of San Francisco spreads over the hills. This important financial and commercial center of the West had long been restricted from expansion to the north by the natural barrier of the Golden Gate. The completion of the great span of the Golden Gate Bridge provides the long-sought outlet in that direction. As if heralding this accomplishment, the Marin Tower stands like a beckoning sentinel. The horizontal cross struts above the roadway level are unique in suspension bridge design. They serve to make the tower legs act as a unit in resisting lateral forces. They were erected by special tackles suspended from the traveler frame after it had passed their position. As soon as these 10-foot wide struts were secured in place, they were planked over and used as storage platforms for rivets, bolts, and miscellaneous equipment. When the top cross strut was in place, the Marin Tower was virtually completed. Meanwhile, well, the massive uh, cable paddle well, had been cast in the company's large steel foundry at its Bethlehem, Pennsylvania plant. Each saddle weighs approximately 150 tons. Because of their size, the saddles were cast in three sections, which were bolted together. Smooth grooves were machined in them to aid in shaping the cables. The saddles were mounted on nests of rollers to provide for longitudinal tower movement during the erection of the suspended span. Later, they were fixed in position and the heavy jacking brackets removed from the tower. Except for minor finishing touches, Bethlehem's work of erecting the Marin Tower was concluded. Across the gate, several months later, erection of the San Francisco Tower was started. Like the Marin Pier, the surface of the South Pier was accurately leveled by grinding before the steel slabs were laid in place. Over 1,100 feet from shore, in 100 feet of water, this pier represents one of the most difficult underwater construction problems ever attempted. It is surrounded by a heavy elliptical fender wall of concrete. Designed as a protection against severe tidal conditions while the pier was being constructed, the wall now protects the completed pier from storms and possible damage from floating objects. The same traveler was used that had been employed in erecting the Marin Tower. When the diagonal bracing members were swung into position, the tower began to take shape. At the water's edge stands the concrete pylon over which the cables bend before delivering their load to the anchorage. Heavy wire ropes embedded within its walls lock the cables securely against vertical movement. In order to carry out the predetermined program, 
a definite schedule was maintained by the Kalmar line boats in delivering steel to Alameda for temporary storage. The steel work in each leg was erected to a height of 125 feet above the diagonal bracing at the roadway before reaching the first cross strut. The next strut is 100 feet above it and like the first, 30 feet in depth. The upper struts are each 22 feet deep and 84 and 77 feet apart respectively. Adding the cable saddles substantially completed the erection of the San Francisco Tower. The transverse struts of the towers were completely covered with steel plates. At the top struts, however, these enclosures were omitted until the spinning of the cables was completed. Every precaution was taken in the fabrication of these quarter-inch steel plates to secure sharp edges, perfect lines, and smooth surfaces. At close range, the pleasing effect of the step-back towers and the cross-strut plate enclosures can be appreciated. From pier to saddle top, as well as along the horizontal cross struts, the continuity of line is unbroken. The next step in the construction program was the spinning of the cables. The wire was furnished and the cables spun and placed by John A. Roebling Sons Company. Traveling at 640 feet a minute, spinning carriages shuttled from anchorage to anchorage pulling the loops across the sand. 80,000 miles of wire, slightly more than 3 16th inch in diameter, were required for the two cables. As the carriages traveled back and forth, strand after strand was formed, compacted and placed in the saddles. After the spinning operation, the cables were hydraulically compacted along their entire length to 36 and a half inches in diameter and the suspenders placed in preparation for the erection of the suspended stand. As a protection against corrosive influences, the cables were painted and then wrapped with galvanized wire. This work was not started until the erection of the suspended stand was well along and the cables had assumed their theoretical curve. While the cables were being spun, steel was being received at the Alameda shipyard from Bethlehem's Eastern Fabricating Works. Approximately 18,000 tons of steel, comprising three quarters of the amount remaining to be erected, were received during this interval. The material, with the exception of the four beams, was light enough to be handled by the ship's tackle. At the storage yard, the steel was unloaded, sorted, and placed in piles, arranged in such a way as to facilitate its reshipment to the bridge. A certain repetition of pattern may be noticed in the piles of stored material, indicating how the members, which were to go in any one barge load, were grouped together. Four complete panels of the stiffening trusses and floor system, weighing about 300 tons, were shipped at a time. The floor beams alone contain enough steel to build a 30-story office building. There are 255 of them embodied in the structure, each about 9 feet deep, 88 feet long, and averaging 24 tons in weight. End to end, their total length is 3 and one half times that of the bridge. Bearing plates of variable thicknesses, riveted to the top flanges, support the roadway stringers at the correct elevations for developing the roadway crown. The Alameda Works of Bethlehem Steel Company, with its extensive fabricating facilities, is located near the storage yard. This plant has a capacity of 2,000 tons a month and supplies much of the Pacific Coast's requirements for fabricated steel. From the storage yard, the steel was conveyed to the bridge site in 500-ton capacity steel barges, whose arrival was scheduled to ensure a constant flow of material to the erectors. This shipment, coming in under control of a seagoing tug, consisted largely of floor beams. Unloading took place after the barge had been warped against the heavy timber shield protecting the pier. At the start of erection of the suspended span, material was stored on the pier. However, storage space was later provided on the roadway floor and material hoisted to it from the barges. 
By this time, both cables had been spun and compacted, and some of the cable bands had been placed. In order to prevent any delay in the program, the plan of partial cantilever erection, although more costly, was adopted. The first three panels of steel were erected with Chicago booms located at the roadway level by cantilevering from the towers. The travelers, one for the main span and one for the side span, were then assembled. Similar work was also going on at the other tower. One of the features in the erection of the Golden Gate Bridge was the use of a huge safety net for the protection of the workmen. A skeleton frame, assembled at water level, carried the net forward under the suspended span. The safety net, constructed of three eight-inch manila rope, woven in six-inch squares, extended 10 feet outside of each stiffening truss. Vertical members of the steel frame rolled along the top cords of the trusses so that the net always kept pace with the erection. After assembly on the barge and with the first section of net attached, the frame was hoisted as a unit into its position below the steelwork by the Chicago booms. It was then tied off to steel cables and the net traveler adjusted for forward travel. Four net travelers were required, one for each side span and two for the main span. They were cantilevered sufficiently far in advance of the erection travelers to provide adequate protection for the workmen. The first three panels of roadway were planked over to provide storage space for the floor steel. The various members were lifted directly from the barges to the platform and held there until needed. They were then forwarded on a steel buggy which rolled along the floor stringer. By this time, the cable contractor had erected a sufficient number of suspenders so that erection could proceed in the normal manner. One A-frame and three stiff leg travelers, each of 35 ton capacity, were used in erecting the stiffening trusses and floor steel. They were conventional steam-powered derricks, mounted on wheels and equipped with booms sufficiently long to cover the 90 feet of width. After erecting two 25-foot panels in advance, the traveler pulled itself to its next position by cables fastened forward. When the move was completed, jacks located at various points under the base were screwed down and the traveler made secure. A tie-down at the rear, fastened to a floor beam, prevented the traveler from tipping forward under certain loading conditions. Material as needed was transferred from the storage platform on a steel buggy, propelled by means of an endless cable driven by machinery on the pier top. Upon reaching the traveler, the buggy was immediately unloaded and the material stored at a convenient point for erection in the structure later. The members on the buggy are the verticals required for two panels of trusses, constituting a complete erection sequence. They were picked up individually and placed in the stand. One of the verticals unloaded from the buggy is being lowered into its position on the bottom cord. The sequence in which the members were assembled was a new development in suspension bridge erection and proved to be highly satisfactory. After the traveler had been moved forward, two panels of trusses were added by cantilevering them from the steelwork previously erected. Each cantilevered section was raised sufficiently to engage the suspenders, then slacked off to transfer the load to the main cables. Finally, the floor beams, lateral bracing, and stringers were put in place. As the travelers progressed outward from the towers, only those stringers necessary for supporting equipment were erected. All of this work was performed over the safety net, which was also cantilevered from the trusses ahead of the steelwork. As the net traveler moved forward, the heavy mesh was paid out, providing protection for riveters, carpenters, and painters who followed. Another vertical is picked up, upended, and placed in position, the first step in the sequence previously mentioned. It will be supported by the bottom cord until the panel is completed. At the bottom are the gussets,
shock riveted to it, which connect it to the bottom cord and also serve as cord splice material. Special equipment was needed for the erection of the members near the center of the span because of the interference of the catwalk. Toward the towers, where the cables were high above the roadway, the members of the stiffening trusses were erected directly by the traveler. As the clearance decreased, the final placing of the members, in this case the web diagonals, was performed with a set of falls suspended from the cables and an outhaul connected to the span. At some points, portions of the catwalk were removed to provide the working clearance necessary for the fall. The necessity of rigging special equipment for each member made an appreciable difference in the erection speed. The next piece erected in the standard sequence was the top cord. This member lies across the top of the vertical and diagonal members just erected. After it was swung into place and connected, there was completed a 50-foot two-panel truss cantilevered forward from that portion of the truss hanging in the suspenders and carried by the cable. The advanced suspenders hung slack and were not connected to the advancing truss until the forward vertical was erected. First, the rear end of the cord was slipped partially into place. Its forward end was then started down toward the upper end of the forward web diagonal. At the rear end, the cord moved down between the gussets and suddenly was pulled home till the milled ends of the two cords touched each other. Finally, the forward end dropped the remaining distance and was bolted to the diagonal. By pushing the advanced suspenders to one side, the way was cleared for the erection of the forward vertical. The upper end of this vertical contains the seats, which take the suspender sockets. The sockets were engaged in their seats soon after the member was pinned fast. Owing to the twist in the suspender cables, the sockets hung several inches above the seats against which they were to bear. To make the connection, the cantilevered truss sections were raised by the traveler sufficiently to permit slipping the sockets into place. After being connected, the traveler slacked off its lines, thereby transferring the truss load to the main cables. Before the traveler could be moved ahead in preparation for the next erection step, it was necessary to erect the floor system. The floor beams came first. These members, the largest and heaviest in the suspended span, were framed between the verticals. Before leaving Bethlehem's eastern fabricating shops, the holes in the floor beams and verticals forming the connection had been reamed to the same template to ensure matching. The top laterals were next erected. These box-shaped diagonal bracing members lying in a horizontal plane beneath the roadway, transmit the lateral forces of the span to the towers and prevent excessive sidewise movement. Floor stringers laid on top completed these two panels and the erection sequence. Another began, however, when both safety net and traveler were advanced. Every phase of bridge construction was thoroughly checked by Bethlehem superintendent of erection and the resident engineer. Under the structure and to the rear of the travelers, the nets were paid out continuously. Two factors made possible their use. First, the bridge employs no bottom lateral system. And second, all material was delivered to the travelers over the top instead of being hoisted from barges below. The many safety features adopted on this job led to a safety record unprecedented in large-scale steel erection. Composition safety helmets gave protection against falling bolts and pins. Safety belts were supplied for conditions requiring only limited movement by the bridgemen. The rope fastened to the belt was attached to some rigid support in such a manner as to cause little inconvenience and yet furnish additional security over that provided by the net.
When not in use, the rope was coiled neatly in such a manner as not to interfere with the bridgeman's movement. On their outward pass, the travelers erected the stiffening trusses, floor beams, bracing, and some stringers. On their return trip, they filled in the remainder of the stringers, sidewalk, railing, and light miscellaneous material. From the tower, the seven lines of stringers first erected stand out clearly. These stringers supported the travelers, material buggies, and miscellaneous equipment during the erection of the suspended span. As the two arms of the center span approached each other, the upward curvature of the floor caused by partial loading gave the impression that they would meet in a peak. But as the travelers drew near each other, the more equal distribution of weight brought the span to the predetermined parabolic curve. The various stages of the erection sequence were so planned that cable curvature and saddle movement were always under control. Riveters and painters followed the raising gangs. Supported from the cables above the roadway, the workmen applied the final coat of paint to the suspender ropes. They were able to ascend or descend at will, simply by reeling the supporting line in or out on a small hand crab located above their heads. Distance dwarfs the size of these men as they apply their craft high above the waters of the Golden Gate. Both main stand travelers were here within speaking distance, bringing to an end their first or outward pass. Beneath them, the net travelers had already met, stretching a continuous mesh under the entire span. When the cord members closed this gap, the golden gate was at last bridged with steel. After the top cords were erected, a slight opening existed between the two members. At the towers, the rocker vents were rotated sufficiently to close this gap and bring the cords into contact. Then they were pinned fast. The closing bottom cords were fabricated with sufficient clearance to be entered. After being placed, they were jacked endways a predetermined amount and held in this position until rigidly connected. This operation ensured that each member in the structure would be properly stressed. Here is Joseph B. Strauss, chief engineer of the Golden Gate Bridge and Highway District and designer of the bridge. From underneath the bridge and to one side, one observes the strange beauty of the pattern formed when structural elements, simple in themselves, are repeated in what seems an infinite projection. The smooth flowing lines again emphasize the hugeness of the span across the Golden Gate. A second pass of the travelers concluded Bethlehem's erection activities. The sidewalk steel, with a corresponding portion of roadway curb attached, was fabricated and erected in panel length. The curb sections, however, were temporarily detached and set back several feet in order to provide working clearance for the equipment used by the paving contractor. The hand railing was fabricated in half panel length. Several sections were unloaded from the buggy at a time and placed on the sidewalk steel. Each piece was then repicked with a runner line, butted against its neighbor, and firmly connected. Painters followed the erectors, giving the roadway steel its protective covering. After long study by the architects and engineers, a brilliant orange color, which greatly accentuates the lines of the span, was selected for the final field coat. From the tower top, Parallel lines of stringers reveal the extent of the roadway structure as it neared completion. Both side span and center span travelers on their final pass had reached the tower section to place the last stringers in the roadway. As soon as this work was completed, the four travelers were dismantled and removed to make way for the contractors for the paving.
The work of the paving gangs commenced with the laying of steel reinforcing trusses over the roadway stringers. These reinforcing trusses were used in the concrete floor slab to aid in carrying to the stringers the loads produced by moving vehicles. Spaces inserted at intervals aligned and supported the trusses until they were tack welded to the stringers and longitudinal bars. The rigidity imparted was sufficient to withstand movement of pavers and material buggies. Before the trusses were laid, wooden forms were inserted between the roadway stringers to support the concrete when poured. The concrete for the roadway slab was mixed on the pier, hoisted in buckets to an inclined chute above the roadway level, which discharged into hopper cars spotted on the narrow gauge road. Over this railway, freshly mixed concrete was carried to distribution centers on the side and center stands. From these points, the concrete was conveyed to the pavers in buggies equipped with pneumatic tires. Their use obviated the necessity for the conventional runway of planks, in that the tires served to cushion the load shocks on the steel reinforcing trusses over which they traveled. Men with pneumatic vibrators packed the freshly poured concrete into openings of the reinforcing steel to ensure homogeneousness in the finished roadway slab. Following them on a special runway came a mechanical finishing machine, which further agitated the concrete, screeded the surface, and left the roadway with a crown profile. In smoothing out the remaining surface irregularities, men with hand floats added the finishing touches to the roadway. A distinctive color was adopted for the concrete lane markers, designed to safeguard the traffic moving over the bridge. As this safety device was being embodied in the roadway, other finishing touches were being added all about the structure. Extending upward through the fog, only the tower tops give evidence of the graceful structure below. At this time, the final touches were being added for the formal opening of the bridge to traffic. The catwalks had been removed, and all that remained to be done was the erection of the uppermost strut enclosures. And now, in the twilight of a setting sun, the longest single-span suspension bridge ever attempted stands completed. With elaborate ceremonies on May 28, 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge was formally dedicated and open to the public. As the first lines of traffic crowded the bridge, ships steamed through the gate in salutation, while overhead, airplanes circled the tower, a fitting tribute to so great an accomplishment. Here started a parade, which will continue to flow across the span for generations. What the life of the Golden Gate Bridge will be, no one can foretell. However, with proper maintenance throughout the years, it will endure indefinitely. Its clear span of 4,200 feet may never be surpassed. The streaming columns of traffic flowing north and south give promise of the great usefulness of the Golden Gate Bridge in the future. By surmounting the natural barrier of the waters of the gate, it has opened a new route to the North Country and has brought the neighboring shore within easy reach of the people of San Francisco. And so we leave the Golden Gate Bridge undertaken at a time of worldwide financial depression and constructed under difficulties which at times seem insurmountable, it stands a monument to the courage and foresight of the men who conceived it and of those who made it a reality. I'm disappointed that my great uncle's not in that. He headed the crew that put the first lights on the bridge. Oh, thank you. Did you notice at the beginning, the supervisors were wearing fedoras and the workers wore the hard hats those hard hats were made out of leather. They weren't really very hard. 
Let's see if I can get these chats. Can I say something? Who, who do we have here? I'm Janet Collins. Can you hear me? Yes. My great uncle headed the crew that put the first lights on the bridge. I'm disappointed that they didn't show that at all. Um, this was just, this was done by Bethlehem Steel for the main construction. I'm sure there was lots of um, added things that were done later. So who wants to be a painter on the Golden Gate Bridge? Wow. Yes, Judy, construction started on my birthday in 1933. So does anybody have any stories of um, the Golden Gate Bridge on maybe when they walked over it on the 50th birthday or something like that? Hi there, um, my name's Karen Buchanan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I've uh, worked for the Golden Gate Bridge for the last 25 years in uh, four different departments, but I got my start in the engineering department in 1996. And I absorbed the entire history of, of the bridge and, and all the construction details. And I've, I've actually seen that movie because it was like um, an orientation film they, they showed us as new. Oh, great. And uh, so I, I, um, I do have um, some interesting stories. Um, the, uh, th there's a, a, a special employee perk um, known as Tower Tours. And when, when in the beginning of the film, when they were talking about the tower cells, um, you can um, get a tower tour. You, you have to go into the, there's an arch door in the base of each tower. And you, you walk in, you go about 20 feet, and there's an elevator. It's a vintage um, open cage elevator with one of those accordion type doors. And it, it's about the size of a phone booth. And you get in there and, and um, you squeeze in and it takes about five minutes to go all the way to the top strut. And you get out onto an interior platform. And, and while you're going up, um, you can see the interior of, of all the tower cells. And of course, they're just basic uh, steel uh, gray inside because they don't need to be painted. Um, and once you get up to the uh, top strut, uh, there's a 20 foot ladder and you climb up that to a, a hatch that weighs about 75 pounds, solid steel, and you, you uh, lift that up and you pull yourself out wearing your hard hat and you can walk. There's a, a platform at the, on top of the top strut that's about six feet wide. And it's got the most amazing view you can imagine because it's 746 feet above the water. Wow. And so we'll, we'll pass on that um, destination walking tour. <laughs> you can, there's a show on um, uh, Dirty Jobs and Bay Area Backroads that shows you that tour going inside, but I didn't know that anybody could go on that. I thought you had to be special invitation by somebody that knows somebody that knows yeah. somebody else. I did not say it, just anybody can go. You have oh, to good. I didn't think so. I, I said it was a, a special perk just for employees. Oh, okay. Okay. Friends and relatives. So I, I gave... Maybe. I gave a tower tour in 2007 to uh, Jeff Clark, the, the guru of the Maverick Surf Contest, and uh, we, we timed it for uh, Blue Angels uh, flyby. Oh, wow. Blue Angels uh, Fleet Week, and it was amazing. Oh, wow. That was the That's most incredible. Anyway. Anybody else have a story? It looks like Mark Friedman ha has his hand. Why has he got, I see that little hand. That's cute. You, you got something to say, say Mark? Let me unmute myself. There was a little contest in the IJ probably about 10 years ago, whatever. Greatest story about the, the uh, Bone Gate Bridge. And what I noticed when I was younger, washing windshields at the Arco gas station on in San Rafael, that a lot of the older commuter cars had very light splotches of uh, Golden Gate paint. Because you remember, they used to tell you, close your windows, sandblasting the head. <laughs> maybe some people did or whatever, but it was really interesting. A lot of windshields had that little specks of gold, gold gate paint on. It was pretty cool. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll mute. Anybody else? Well, you yeah, know, it's, um, yeah, I do. People wonder who paid for that Golden Gate Bridge, and it most certainly wasn't taxpayers in San Francisco. They really had uh, uh -huh. no interest or uh, need to drive, to pay for a bridge to drive to Marin County. So that bridge was, uh, the bonds were written by uh, Giannini's Bank of Italy, 
um, with the requirement that the uh, union workers that they represented were hired to do the uh, work. And so anybody who during the depression years came out from the East had to join one of those unions so they could get a job there. But it was the dairy ranchers of Northern California who really needed to get their products over to the hotels for their exclusive contracts in San Francisco. So they wanted the bridge. So we paid for that Golden Gate Bridge. So who, who had a story? Um, I do. Uh, and you are? Mary Minor. Okay. Um, the man that built our house was a watchman on the Golden Gate Bridge. So he uh, really scavenged a lot of stuff. So all of the concrete that's in the original foundation of our house is all from the Golden Gate Bridge. It's huge. And then he scrounged all this lumber from scaffolding. So if you go under our house and you look at the joists that hold up the living room, you can tell they're all concrete forms and stuff and they're gigantic. And then in one of the walls, we were able to open it up and you could tell that it was all old Golden Gate Bridge two by fours that's holding up that wall. Mm. And he happened to come by our house when we were remodeling it. So that's when we found out everything about it. We live on San Francisco Boulevard. Well, everything on the Golden Gate Bridge is huge. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, we have some really big beams under there that are like, ooh, I don't know. 10 by 10s, I think. They're, gi they're gigantic. They're just huge. Anyway, that's all. Why is Judy Maine correcting my math? What? It was a year, it was a year apart from when um, the date was um, a day apart from when you could walk on it or when you could drive over it. And the construction started in 33 and uh, wasn't uh, completed and open till um, 37. Okay, nothing else? So I guess we'll close for the night and thank you. And I, I, just, I, wanted, I just wanted to add, you know, there were a, a lot of- uh, Who's this? Some, this is George Silvestri. Uh, I, was born, I was born in San Francisco a month and a day before Pearl Harbor and uh, grew up in San Rafael. So you do okay. the math. But uh, I appreciated your comment about AP Giannini because I did know that he, he made it possible for the bonds to be funded that built the bridge. Um, yeah. And I, I, I just think it's, uh, it's sad that people of my parents and grandparents' age uh, aren't around to tell the stories that they witnessed uh, leading up to and during the construction. When I was a Boy Scout in San Rafael in the late 40s, early 50s. I remember meeting one of my father's uh, friends, Dick Zollner, who had uh, was a contractor at the Zollner Construction Company at the time. But I remember just being mesmerized by his stories of during the Depression, getting a job on the construction crew to work on the bridge. Uh, there was nothing said about how many workers died during the construction. That was a sort of a smoothed over, but I, I'm sure there were some. Fortunately, Dick Zollner was a, a very careful guy and uh, uh, managed to uh, survive that ordeal. But they, it, were very, they were very big on um, safety there. You know, they required you to wear that yeah. belt and that rope, although they didn't do it. You, did you see in the beginning, those men were wearing um, fedoras and, and uh, little beanies, not the hard hats with, that were even leather, but... Yeah. Um, I think it was less than 20, maybe see, nine I, or 11. I, I have, this is Karen Buchanan again, the Golden Gate Bridge District employee. How, how many died? Uh, 11. 11, there, and it was in one accident, wasn't it? One accident in the, uh, when it, it was in March of 1937, only two months before it, it finished. Actually, February, I'm sorry, February of 1937, only uh, three months before it finished. And they were the uh, scaffolding that they were showing you next to the net. The the a bolt uh, broke loose on the scaffolding, and there were um, nineteen people, uh, nineteen workers on that scaffolding when it fell, and it broke through the net. And eleven of the workers uh, fell to their deaths in the bay, but the eight that were clinging onto the scaffolding 
survived and they they formed a, a club a fraternity called the halfway to hell club oh. <laughs> and, and, and it was only the, halfway oh my god one of those men um became the fire chief of of the city of belvedere oh wow was one of the first uh, homeowners of, uh, oh thank you janet you had a quick question it wasn't a question i just wanted to say um i heard about my aunt and uncle being in, in the when they first opened the bridge they had a, hundreds of people got to walk across it when it was first opened. And more than of, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Some of my relatives were among those people. Yeah, they, and, and then when they got to the North Shore, they had to turn around and face all those people that were still walking north. <laughs> OK, thank you, everyone. <laughs> there's, and there's, there's, one, there's one thing I don't think any, did anyone mention Charles Ellis? Does anyone know about who that was? Well, he's he's very involved in the story of the of the making of the bridge. This, this exactly this show tonight was just on the on the workers, the engineers who built the bridge. Okay, wonderful. The engineers who built it and, and the people who did this and, and one thing Ellis contributed and that the current anyone who was still alive when they were having the dedic the uh, rededication a few years back of the bridge. Those guys said that this guy who was uh, fired by Strauss, who was one of the uh, people who designed it, you're absolutely right. He didn't do the building and tonight's story is on a different topic. But for those who might be interested at the Golden Gate side of the bridge, they have finally, finally at long last put up a little sign in tribute. If you walk up just a few steps onto the bridge, there is actually a little placard mentioning this guy. And, and it's worth knowing what he did, um, even though he had been let go, uh, he contributed, and those who are still alive or knew the stories said how much he did to make the design he, work. He deserves a lot more credit than he, than uh, Strauss uh, took. Much away from more. Him. Strauss did the promotion and all, but but this Charles Ellis was the designer who did the most, and and a lot of the people who were still alive when they had, are, are, they all say that. So anyone probably, who's at all curious, look it up because it's it's worthwhile. A, a measure of egos. Um, uh, Joseph Strauss fired Charles Alton Ellis on August 30, August 30th, 1930, uh, when the design was, was due to the board of directors and uh, Ellis was such a perfectionist that he, he, was, he refused to give uh, him the final plan. So Joseph Strauss was impatient and fired him on the spot. And um, then he, he hired his, his uh, uh, Ellis's apprentice Clifford Payne to take his place and get all the credit for that hard work. And um, if you read the book by John Vanderzee called The Gate, it came out in 1986, just in time for the 50th anniversary. It tells the whole untold, previously untold story of Charles Alton Ellis's contributions to the design of the bridge. Okay. It's Very called the, the Gate, right? I have to try to find that. Thanks for, please let her know all about this, uh, our, pre oh. our uh, organizer. Thank you for doing such a magnificent job. I, I, as one individual, would love to know more about the gate and, and uh, where to find it. Or wh who is the author of that again? Whoever, someone had piped up and was telling about it. But thank you for sharing that, because that's so, so important to how, why and how it, it, it all came about. The and author, tributes. Yeah, the author is John Van Der Zee, and I'm going to type it in the chat for you guys, OK? Unfortunately, um, the film is not for sale, but it, this um, presentation is recorded and you can locate it on our website. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, whoever was who, whoever it was who said about John Van Der Zee and about the book, et cetera. I don't know who was speaking, but- yeah, uh, good book. It's a good book. Okay, thank you everyone and good night and we'll see you next month. Thank you, I'm Christine Torrington, much appreciating. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.